Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kendra Cook and I'm with the CORE Training and I am super excited to bring you another conversation with Kendra today. And as you know, this is our inspiration part of what we do here at coaching uh, at the CORE Training. So we teach you a lot of systems and structure and accountability. And then we bring this piece in that we like to call inspiring and we do a lot of change the planet activities. And this is probably one of the biggest highlights that I get to do here at the CORE. And today we have an amazing guest and we met by fluke, so I'm going to give you a little background. Um, being new to Charlotte, I'm always looking for places to plug in, and I had the opportunity to join a supper club. And so what we do with some ladies, we pick a different restaurant once a month, and we all go, and we pay our own way, but we just talk about life stuff. Really very little about business, if any at all, We and from different walks of life, and uh, we just share stuff. And so my very first time of having dinner with our guest today, Somebody said, tell Kendra your story. And she's like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Very humble. And um, so uh, we pulled it out of her and she gave me just a little snippet. And so we started talking about her coming on my podcast uh, probably six months ago. And because of the holidays and COVID and all this crazy stuff, we haven't been able to align our schedules. But today I'm super honored to um, have some time with Miss Lisa Standerling. And um, we're going to jump right in, Lisa. Thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate your time and uh, you're going to inspire a lot of people here today. So we're going to jump in. So I want to start out, we're going to set the stage with Lisa and I'm going to give her a date and ask her how her day started that day. And uh, then we'll come back and probably you guys will catch on to what that date is all about. But January 15th, 2009, Lisa, you woke up that morning and what that day looked like for you when you got started? Well, actually, a pretty typical day. Um, I was in New York at the time I worked for Belk Department Stores as a buyer, and we traveled pretty much every month to New York and or California, and January was always New York. So it started as a typical day, just got up, got ready, packed my bags because it was leaving day, did a few appointments, went back to the hotel, grabbed my bags, off in a car you went to the uh, airport to come home. Great. So um, what did you do for Belk? I was a buyer. Okay, so you traveled, looked at merchandise, bought it for the stores, and sent it back. Yes, okay. yes, at the particular time I was in the junior world. I've been in many's, but that was junior fashion at the time, so we traveled quite a bit. Okay, perfect. So if you haven't picked up on what this date is, January 15th of 2009, that is the day that the miracle on Hudson happened. Just so happened that when Lisa went to the airport on that day to leave New York, she happened to be on Sully's plane. So. I want her to set this stage. She's on the plane. They take off. Give us a, a you know three five minutes something. What that looks like. How did they tell you that you were in trouble? How did they prepare you guys? Because I think there's a ton of lessons here in business right now. Um, I didn't say this yet, but I will. That Lisa's now a realtor, and so it's kind of like real estate. We're juggling a bunch of balls. There's stuff coming at us all the time. Now I'm not comparing that to the day I'm in, in the airplane. <laughs> but she probably handled it about like she handled her real estate business. So I'm excited for her to kind of set the stage for us. You're on the plane. What happens? What's it look like? Sure. I mean, again, very, very typical, just take off. I'm looking at a magazine, my guilty pleasure on the, you know, on the takeoff and for the you know quick hour and a half trip home basically. And, you know, we were on a uh, flight took off at like 325, a little bit late, like normal sometimes too, coming out of LaGuardia. And um, all of a sudden you just, you hear this noise and I was like, okay, what's that? And I thought I smelled smoke and, I turned around to about three rows behind me is my boss who is not a good flyer. And I looked at her in her mouth, I'm like, are you okay? And she looked at me like, um, no. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> later I felt really stupid for asking her that question. So I was like, okay, so I turned around and then, and then you could kind of tell the plane was turning around. I'm like, okay, something's going on, we're going back. Cause we were so, I mean, we had not even reached the right altitude yet. But for me, I didn't realize we had already lost both engines. Some people had because they were closer, they could see the wings, they could see the flames. Um, and then right after that, all you hear is Sully going, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain brace for impact. And I was like, oh gosh. And I looked at you know the people next to me and I didn't know, I was on the aisle and I didn't know either of the passengers next to me. And all of a sudden we locked arms and we introduced ourselves to each other. And, and then you just hear the flight attendants going brace, 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 brace. And I grabbed my phone, turned it on, which is like a totally rule follower and never turn on my phone when you're not supposed to on the, on the flights. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to call my family. And then I was like, no, I can't do that. This can't be the last thing that they hear. That would be horrible. So I turned it back off, but I held it going, okay, if we make it out of this, then I can call. Um, 
And then I just remember it, it beyond the chanting, it was not very chaotic. It was, I wouldn't say peaceful, but there was people you could tell praying and Christy, who was um, my seatmate in the window, literally was looking and she's going, we're going in the water. And I'm going, no, 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 no we can't go in the water she goes no no we're going in the water I'm like no we're, we're gonna like drown because that's the only thing I'm thinking of is we're gonna drown and she goes it's way better than hitting a building or you know land so she she literally talked us the entire way down she was so calm and just kept going okay we're almost there we're almost there we're almost there and then the background is like brace 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 and then you're trying to remember how to brace and all that but um then it it hit and honestly it was a hard hit we all flew forward my phone flew across the plane and I, I got some bruises and stuff but so minor comparative um and then it did a flip or turn you know and then we stopped and it's like you just pause and are like okay wait we're all here and then it was then they're yelling you know exit the plane exit the plane we quickly I was only a couple rows in front of the exit row so quickly get out did everything you're not supposed to didn't grab the life draft didn't grab a, anything to protect myself <laughs> Because I, I didn't even grab my purse. I was like, I'm out and uh, got on the wing and kind of just like those kind of just dumb thoughts. You just very simple. I'm like on the wing, plane's going to sink. I need to get off the wing. So I couldn't get in the raft. So I had to jump in the water to get in the raft. And then by the time I was in the raft, you look up and the very first ferry was already there. It was crazy how quick they were there. Wow. Okay, so every time she tells the story, I have goosebumps. If y'all are watching this or listening to this, you're probably like, whew, I don't know how I would have got through that um, with that calm, you know, sense of like putting it all together, get my phone. I don't know. I probably would have been screaming or something. But um, so, you know, I, I when the first time you told me this story, I kind of in my mind was like, you know, I'm going to start paying more attention when they give me the announcement. Like, where is my water vest in case I need it? You know, mm -hmm. how many of us get on the plane and we just tune that out? We put our headphones in, we get our magazine, our book, and we're just like, oh, I've heard this a hundred times. But then mm -hmm. in the actual time that it happened that you needed it, didn't even go there in your mind. You were just trying to get out. So yeah, it was just fit, fit. I'm going to, all right, I'm out. <laughs> right. So what's going through your mind? I mean, you talk about, I'm going to call my family now I'm not um you get in the the lifeboat what what's going through your mind I mean how are you say is everybody calm or is there utter chaos is people screaming like what did that scene look like you know for the most part and you know we keep we then we call ourselves a 1549 family so we keep in touch a lot of us we have different events and all that but every time anyone tells a story, there's no really bad story from that day. People were helping. There was an elderly lady. They made sure she got off. There were people passing an infant across to make sure the infant was off into a raft. And once the ferry boats came, the infant and the elderly lady were first off the rafts. So everybody was very accommodating to each other. There was no pushing. There was no craziness. You know, when, when, when I finally got on that raft, someone looks at me because you don't have a life jacket. So they gave me a life jacket, put it on, inflated it for me and I turned around and did the same thing for someone else I had to help pull somebody out of the water and then we did have um and it's in one of the pictures it's kind of funny there that was posted all over the place there was a girl from Australia and she was so worried because all of her life like her her passport and everything was still on the plane and she's like how am I going to get home so she was a little panicked but she wasn't crazy but she wanted like to go back on the plane to get her stuff, even after it was at that point already starting to sink. And I had to say, you'll be fine. They'll figure out a way for you to get home. Don't worry. Right, right. So once you guys got on the ferry, uh, how many ferry boats, was there two or three? Can't remember there were, the there was at least two big ferry boats. There was two on one side. And then I think there was a third on the other where we were on the very last raft and it was still tethered to the plane. So they came and got us last. There's about 10 of us on that. And it, they came with a really small boat that we had to kind of crawl in and underneath to get on. So basically depending on what side of the plane you are and when they got you, they took some of the passengers to the New York side and some of the passengers to New Jersey side. And then we actually ended up being in this um, small my, couple, not couple, but I'd say 50 people in um, an old restaurant that's no longer open in Weehawken, New Jersey. And that's where they kind of started taking care of us and the Red Cross showed up and, you know, we went from there after that. 
So how long was it before you could call your family? Because the phone went flying. I'm thinking <laughs> if my parent, okay, my mother is like the worry work. She has to know the flight. She tracks it on her phone. I mean, if she would have seen that I wasn't moving out of New York, she would have been on the phone with my husband. They would have had a search warrant. I mean, that's, I know that's a little dramatic, but it's the truth. You know, when people, your loved ones know that you're on that plane, I mean, it had to be a ma matter of moments before that was all over news and TV. I mean, how long is it before you get to your family? How do you notify your family? What, what's going on during all that time? Well, I think it was, it remarkably, it was not that long. It was probably, I want to say it was a little bit after four, say somewhere between four and 4.15. So a half an hour later, by the time, since the ferries were so quick, um, and we, we had one guy that would actually worked with us is a Kent swim. So he stayed on the wing the whole time. So he still had his cell phone or the, us, there was five of us girls. We didn't have our friends at all. They were waterlogged if you even had them on you. So we took turns calling. Um, I called, my son was only five at the time. So I had to call his, his dad, but, um, and tell him. And he, he was like, Oh my God, glad everything's okay. You know, the hardest call was my parents. Yeah. My, my now husband didn't answer the phone. He didn't know who was calling anyway. And he didn't really understand the message until I called him back because he was like, Oh, I hadn't seen the news yet. But my dad answered the phone and I just said, I'm okay. I was in a plane crash and his, he was like, I'm uh, sorry, I might get start, <laughs> startled a little bit. He was like, what, what, what? And they could tell he was getting emotional. I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to keep it together right now because I'm trying to keep it together and not lose it. Yeah. I said, I am fine. But, you know, everybody seems to be fine. Everybody's accounted for it, seems like so far. Um, but just, you know, explain it to him real quick. And I said, I'll, I'll call you back in a little bit. So that was the first notice. <laughs> Yeah, and so then you guys get to this building. Half of you are somewhere, half of you are somewhere else. Mm -hmm. What are they doing to take care of you all? I mean, what does that look like? Is everybody just getting checked out? Or yeah, when we first like for us and our some people on the New York side, there was a few people that were hurt. You know, had some someone break their sternum, someone cut their leg. Um, so some of those people went you know right to the emergency room. Where we were in this restaurant, um, they, you know, I just remember getting off the docks and just ripping that life jacket off. I was like claustrophobic, I was like this, get this thing off of me. And as I'm walking in this restaurant, some man takes a sweater, much bigger man than I, takes a sweater off and hands it to me, puts it over me. Then they have us go in there and we literally had to take, because we we're soaking wet, we had to take all our clothes off because you were just freezing because you were starting to get blue and all that. And then some, some man gave me his chef pants, like a size 52 chef <laughs> pants. I'm like holding them on. And we just kind of like, everybody's just checking on us, making sure they're okay. And they basically give you tags to identify you. And um, they wouldn't allow you to look at the TV because at that moment, they still didn't know what caused it you know was this an act of terrorism which a lot of people in new york were really worried because they had, had sure. you know been there for 9 11 that someone took the plane down and so i just remember even trying to go to the bathroom and stop to look at the tv and they were like no no you can't look at the tv but i'm like but i was on that plane i don't what what i can't they're like not yet so we probably stayed there just they like brought us like warm drinks and just more blankets and clothes and then from there they took us um to a like a senior citizen center and the two different groups in New Jersey all became into one place and then that's when the rest like Red Cross really showed up they started trying to book anybody flights if they wanted to home or you know help call family members or get you hotels if you wanted to stay just kind of really anything that you needed they were there to do so I guess my next question is how hard was it to get on the next flight oh my word yeah, let's say I was one of the people that did not get on the flight. Neither did my boss that I said was not did does not fly well. Her husband flew up and the three of us drove back together the next day. Um, but the very next flight was almost two weeks later because it was market time again. And we ended up postponing it for a day because last minute, um, 60 minutes called and Katie Kirk was coming to Charlotte with Sully, Jeff, the co-pilot and all the crew so we could all meet them and do a show. So we're like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait one day. We're not going to go yet. So it was, it, that was great because we got to meet them and how humble Sully is and Jeff and all of them and really thank them and just have an emotional time. And then like an hour after that, I got on a plane, I'm not going to lie. I might've had a glass of wine or two <laughs> <laughs> holding my friend's hands <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and took off for New York again. <laughs> 
Wow. So do you still fly? I mean, are you okay with flying now? I mean, have you, has it come around or is there still that anxiety that? Um, there is some anxiety. It's gotten better. I did, you know, after that, I, I decided to move on to another job at Belk because the, the constant flying was too much for me. Yeah. And I just decided I needed to slow down a whole lot. Um, so I, I was able to take another position there that was, you know, equal, but only travel like four times a year instead of 12 times a year. Right. And now I really just do it for fun. And usually my husband's with me or family. So I feel a little more comfortable, but I, you know, it just depends. Sometimes I get really nervous, you know, turbulence or anything happens. I'm, sure. Yeah. I might be slightly freaking out, but I kind of have my own ritual now that the moment we start to take off, no one can talk to me. I need to just keep my eyes closed. I do a prayer. Thank God for saving me before. Continue to watch after us and everybody. Like I have this whole little ritual until we're kind of up and leveled out a little bit and calm. So I love that. I love that. Um, so I'll ask this question, then we'll close out. Uh, did you get your suitcase and your phone back off of the Sully plane? <laughs> I got every, except for my phone, I got every last thing back really like, I, I had a purse and you know I had I, I never took jewelry either barely you know usually just a jewelry I was wearing I didn't mess with it and I had some jewelry on me that I never really wear and some special things like a graduation parent present for my parents and it wasn't until like two o'clock that night and I was like oh my god all that's gone and I went well okay and it was open in my purse black purse little small black bag I was like that's down the Hudson somewhere I'm never gonna see it again whatever got it every last thing back wow it was That's amazing that they were able to recover that yeah so they so did everybody get their stuff back pretty much yep. I mean, Pr pretty much yeah like and I put my coat up and you know whatever the overhead and things that weren't in like your luggage or in a purse that they cannot identify as yours they took pictures tagged it all and then you and they would send it to us and you could um you could say oh yep that's mine that's mine and it took probably I can't remember maybe close to six months before he got it back because it was part of the investigation sure. but every last thing was tissue wrapped like I mean down to an ink pen was taken apart tissue wrapped um wow. but, and I have all of it I kept it all along with every newspaper article I've ever seen I guess wow well I know everybody listening is like okay give us something that you know that changed your life give us two or three things since that day that you do different or that you use in your business or just a big takeaway for us. Cause I mean, some of us sitting here watching this are going to be like, I'm never flying again. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, then the other ones are like, tell me something that, you know, I can put in my business. So give us a couple nuggets uh, that you learned throughout that process that, you know, that you can share with the group listening. Yeah. Well, and I, and, and it does, it's going to sound corny because it is such a cliche and people say it, life is too short, but it is life is too short. You have to just say, you can't worry about the silly small things. Like I, and if I find myself worrying about silly small things right now, like, Oh wait, I didn't get that offer. You know, we lost the contract. Okay. Is it, I hate it, but is it the end of the world? No, the next thing's going to come along. So you just keep trying harder and trying harder and do, do what you can for you, do what you can for others, do what makes you happy. And is, and you know, for me, that's why I switched. I just, I was so tired and so burned out on something that I did over and over as much as I loved it for a long time. It was just time to move on mm -hmm. and have more time and be able to kind of make my own schedule to be with my son. He was going to, you know, he's going off to college next year, but this, it gave me a lot more time this past, you know, four or five years to be able to spend time with him and, and, and make the time for doing things that I want to do. And that makes my family happy and, you know, helping people. Yes, absolutely. So some things I took away from here is face your fears. Um, obviously, Lisa got <laughs> back on that plane, uh, maybe not the next day, but a few weeks. So if there's something that is really holding you back because you're terrified or you have that fear, I want to encourage you to take the risk. There is so much growth that comes when you face your fears and you take a risk and move through that, bust through that wall. As a runner, I know it so well. We all hit that wall somewhere in a marathon and we just have to go through it and, and just know that there is a lot of reward on the other side. So that was a big takeaway for me. Number two, life is precious. So if you're watching this and you're working 70, 80, 90 hours a week and your family is getting what's left of you and not what's best of you, shame on you. You gotta fix that. Cause we're not guaranteed tomorrow, as Lisa said, 
you know, life is precious. It can be gone tomorrow. And the number three thing is do what you love. If you're in a, possession, a profession watching this and you don't love what you do, make a change. Might have to go backwards financially, might have to be some risk, might be uncomfortable learning a new skill, but do what you love. So Lisa, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. I know our listeners are going to love hearing this and really just knowing somebody that was on that plane. I read the book, <laughs> I watched the movie, and then I met somebody. She's in the book. If you go by the book, she's mentioned in the book. Uh, so, um, but we're so grateful for you. And thank you so much for your time. Welcome to real estate, uh, you know, to the real estate podcast here at the core. And if we can ever help you with your business, you let us know. Hope you have a great day. Thanks. Lisa. Thanks, Kendra. You Bye, too. Guys. Bye.